Hello, welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you very much for watching the channel, all the comments and subscribers. I greatly appreciate it. We recently crossed 50,000 subs. Awesome, awesome. Thanks so much for the support. As we do in this channel, we are hunting for true cash flow, free cash flow money, hard jack that we can find to figure out how much does this company make and what do we think it's worth if it can keep, keeps going on in the future. This week up, we're going to take a look at Comcast, currently yielding 13% free cash flow. Now, if you bought the stock today, held it for a decade, how much money could you make? Would you beat the stock market? Let's figure out based on our forecast what we can earn by buying the stock today. You ready? Let's get to work. Okay, let's dive through Comcast's uh, annual reports, their 10Ks, and I have behind me the most recent quarterly results. Now, Comcast owns a cable network, right? They supply broadband services, 70% of their revenue, uh, so excuse me, 50% of the revenue, 70% of their EBITDA comes from the fiber optic cable, the coaxial cable that they have laid into the ground across the United States and they're charging people for internet. That is the main staple of their business, internet, voice, phone, all that stuff. They also have recently purchased NBC Universal with the Peacock Network. That is a subscription service, kind of cool. And they own Sky, which is a UK based German and Italian uh, television network. So very into the TV network world, but the lion's share of their money, both revenue and profit, comes from the installed infrastructure providing cable internet and, and, and broadband services to a host of customers across the United States. And that, that is what we want, to, that's what we're interested in because it's a sticky product and we believe in this channel, it's our hypothesis, that those customers will not turn off their internet in a, in a difficult economic world. They'll simply dine out less, they'll turn off other services, they'll cut Netflix, but others, other services before they cut their internet bill. So let's take a look at the financials and figure out what we've got here. Now, before we dive into the financials, we're gonna review the five key attributes that we at this channel use to kind of kick off the valuation of any stock. And those five key attributes are, number one, top line revenue growth, gotta have it. Number two, EBITDA, you want enterprise level earnings growing. Number three, strong free cash flow, kind of the name of the game. Number four, low debt. Low debt is less than three times debt to EBITDA. And number five, number five is a well-priced stock. Now, what is a well-priced stock? It's a price that you can have a conservative forecast out in the future. And with that conservative forecast, you beat the market. That's what we're trying to find. You want to buy something at a low price and, 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 and a good cash flow yield. And over time, that company will compound for you and really help you generate the wealth you're looking for. That's why we call it a well-priced stock. All right, let's dive into Comcast Q2 2020, 2022 financial results. All right, in the past, we have looked at a lot of different companies from the speculative stocks, such as your Snowflakes, your DocuSigns, and so forth, to the cash generation monsters like Amazon and Microsoft. And one thing you will always notice is when you pull up an investor presentation, this is the sales pitch. If you read the 10K, the 10K is the black and white hard facts that the SEC requires companies to print. You want to read that. This, any earnings release that comes in a PDF for you, it's got color in it, that is a sales pitch. Keep that in mind. Ever wonder why the, the, the 10Ks are all black and white? They're required to be. You cannot have color in those documents because it's a required regulatory document. This is a sales job, hence the color. But that said, our, what we always say about development companies, if you look at the snowflakes of the world, if you don't have earnings, you talk about revenue. If you don't have revenue, you talk about customers and TAM, total addressable market. That is all fluff. What we care about here at this channel and what you care about as an equity investor is hard cash money. That's what you want. And what I like here is I'm on slide three, which is the very first real slide of their presentation. And what do they have? They've got revenue, check. They've got adjusted EBITDA, awesome. They have EPS, great. And they have free cash flow. And they're all positive, which is what we want to, what we really like. Companies that have free cash flow bring it forward in their sales deck because it's a really great underpinning of value. It's what companies are valued on. If they don't have it, you won't see it here and all they're talking about is revenue because they can't talk about earnings. If they have no revenue, then they'll talk about customers because they have no revenue to talk about, which they have no cash flow to talk about. So it's, it's all kind of a shell game. And what you really care about is this number here, free cash flow. If that's not on the first two, three slides of a presentation, company's garbage, move on garbage in terms of making cash generation. 
What I also like about this slide is it quickly summarizes their business, the, Go the Comcast business, the NBC Universal, and the Sky. It gives you revenue for each division and their adjusted EBITDA for each division. And you can look at margins to see where they get the most profit. $7.4 billion of adjusted EBITDA for the Comcast business absolutely dwarfs the $2 billion from NBC Universal or the less than $1, bi $1 billion for Sky. So this is their business. They've got $16.6 .6 billion of revenue and they've got $7.4 billion of EBITDA. This mar well, that's almost a 50% margin. So this business is the cash monster here. And what they're doing is they're taking the cash flow from here and they're building out a network of, um, of content that they hope to be produce more cash flow in the future. You know, the subscription model and so forth. So I, I like this deck. I like how they present, present it. Let's keep going. Okay, lesson here. A lot of people focus on the quarter. This is the most recent quarterly information. It's great. But we're long-term investors. We look at 10-year financial models. So you really don't want to con concern yourself too much with quarter to quarter. You want to look at 10 years of history to see what this management tr team has truly done. And so I'm going to skip through this quickly because I really, it's, it's nice that they're growing, but I can't make a 10-year forecast based on one quarter's worth of growth. Uh, more detail, they break down their individual components now. So this is the cable division. I want to reference that they've got 32 million customers. It says it's flat in the quarter, but they added 775,000 customers in the last 12 months. So hopefully that's continuing to grow. If you're interested in this stock, that's definitely something you want to map out. Go back in time and look at their customer acquisition, excuse me, the, the total customers of broadband every single year over the last decade and make sure that's slowly moving north. Um, then they break down the different divisions. That's fine. This is the slide I really wanted to get to. It's the ca free cash flow and capital allocation slide. Number, number First thing we want to look at, what do we say? What's our third, fourth criteria in the uh, criterias? Low debt. We always say less than three times debt to EBITDA. Well, look at this. They're showing you uh, coverage ratios, 2.6 times, 2.3 times. They're referencing the same thing that I have been doing this channel for two years. I'm telling you. Companies that know what they're doing and have conservative banks push down onto them covenants that says you cannot have more than three times debt to leverage. That is too risky, especially in this market. And I love that they're calling it out right there to investors and saying, hey, this is where we are and we're good. We're less than three times. I love that. This is another beautiful slide. This is dividends, not free cash flow. I'd love to have seen free cash flow. But the principle here that I want to illustrate is the compounding or the growth of the free of the dividend over a long time. And if you had bought the, the company back in 2012 or so forth, and you're only making 33 cents a year, that's great. But in that decade, that dividend has tripled and you're now making a dollar every, uh, every year on a cost basis that's a lot lower. So as you build over time, that dividend grows, you never sold, you never flipped the stock, your cost basis is super low, and as a percentage of your cost basis, that dividend gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I once talked to an investor who was, I think he was 65 or 70, and he bought a stock when he was in his 30s. And he said now his annual dividend is his cost basis in that stock, which is amazing. That's like you bought this stock at 33 bucks um, back in 2012, fast forward 40 years and you're getting $33 every single for every share you own every single year as a dividend. That's an amazing part and, and value within equities that I don't think people in the financial markets um, or investors truly understand because the entire stock market is geared to get you to trade in and out of stock, to watch CNBC and feel that you need to jump to the grass is greener. And the reality is oftentimes it doesn't pan out. So I would buy a stock, I would hold it for 20 or 30 years, gift it to your children, be married to the stock, get, this, get the actual stock certificates, put them in a safety deposit box, and only look at it uh, when the annual report comes out, read the annual report. Okay, that's, that's really what, oh, last thing I'll show you is this cash flow bridge. This is kind of an interesting, this is the way finance people talk to one another. They'll take adjusted EBITDA and they'll show you the changes between adjusted EBITDA and free cash flow, which I like to see. And they're saying, hey, this is adjusted EBITDA. And on this channel, we always talk EBITDA is not free cash flow. I totally get that. Charlie Munger has said many times that EBITDA is bullshit. Uh, he is right in a number of instances. The only reason we use it in this channel is because many companies report EBITDA 
And when they make financial transactions, when they acquire a business, they will often express the purchase price as a multiple of EBITDA and it helps us gauge relative value. That's why we use it. Ultimately, we are interested in this number. And what I like about this slide is it bridges adjusted EBITDA to free cash flow. And you can see the biggest chunks, CapEx and taxes. Those are the two biggest things that drive the difference between EBITDA and uh, free cash flow for Comcast. All right, let's take a look at their historical financials. We're going to look at 10 years, and then we're going to figure out what we want to forecast this business. All right, we're doing the forecast now, and I want to plug very quickly my website, cashflowinvestingpro.com. If you like what you're going to see here, I give you this financial model in my investing course. I teach you how to use it so that you can create forecasts for the companies that you own in your portfolio. And I highly, highly recommend that you take the course and that you build forecasts for every single stock that you own. That will limit your portfolio because the sheer work requires you and it will focus you, your efforts on the very best companies that you believe are gonna work out for you. And I like that. Okay, here we go. Revenue, $64.6 .6 billion in 2013. And that has grown to $116 billion over the last nine years. Obviously some acquisitions in there, so it's not all organic, but on average, that is a CAGR of 8% annually over this last time. So that checks the box for revenue growth. They're in a business, they're in an environment that they can grow top line revenue. That's great. Number two, EBITDA. EBITDA is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Why do we add back DNA? DNA is a non-cash charge on the income statement, so we add it back to get closer to what cash is. Taxes, taxes because, well, if you acquire a company entirely, you can kind of adjust the taxes you pay. Remember, these are financial records, not, not tax records. There is a difference between books that companies present to the IRS and company and books they, they present to investors. So we add that back. And then interest, interest is added back because if you acquire a business, you can choose to have it leveraged or not. So we want to see what is the earnings before interest, tax, and depreciation. That's kind of what you're looking for. And that number has gone from $21 billion to $34 billion over this time frame. An average annual growth rate of 6.2%. Uh, this one is 7.6 if I add a decimal. So basically a slight, slight margin erosion over this time, but they're both growing and that's what we like. It's strong single digit growth um, over this time period. All right, that checks the two boxes for EBITDA growth and revenue growth. Let's take a look at enterprise value and look at some relative value metrics. Hey, sorry to interrupt. If you like the content, please subscribe. I greatly appreciate it. Also, if you want more stock tips, check my website out, cashflowinvestingpro.com, where I produce one-pagers like this one, summarizing 10 years of financial information for America Express. I give you a forecast of what I think it's going to do, and currently, I think it's yield 23% IRR for the next decade. An amazing stock pick. There's lots more. Check out the link below for a free one-pager at cashflowinvestingpro.com. Okay, the very first thing we do when we look at enterprise values, we got to look for the debt level. That's what we really want to make sure that's not too high. 47, 48 billion dollars to 107 billion dollars over this period of time. It also includes capitalized leases. That was uh, added into the financials in 2019, I believe. So you'll see a step up naturally uh, from just businesses having to take rents that they have for individual locations and facilities and include that lease, the present value of that decade-long lease as a liability on their balance sheet, whereas historically they did not have to do according to GAAP. <clears throat> so the, you, you always get a step up. Excess cash flow, right? That's cash that we deem above and beyond the required working capital cash that they need to run their business. So for example, if you had a pizza shop, you've got to buy inventory, you got to buy dough, you got to pay your employees, pay the electric bill, pay the gas bill for your oven, and employees are paid every two weeks, whereas you get revenue in every day. So there's a little bit of a timing difference between having to store up cash to make a big uh, payment for your rent, which is once a month, your, your employees, which is twice a month. So the point here is that the cash flow day to day is not even. It is very rocky. And you need enough cash balance on the balance sheet to be able to cut the check to the employees and cut the check to rent and not worry if you have the cash in the balance. So that's what I mean by working capital cash. And then anything above that is excess cash and could theoretically be dividend out to the investors, you and I as dividend holders, uh, as, as equity holders. 
That is excess cash. If you were to buy the company, say today, you walked up and said, hey, I have, I don't know, $300 billion of Jack and I want to buy Comcast, all of it. So what Comcast stockholders would require them to do is they said, that's fine, I'll sell you the business. But this $3.2 billion of excess cash is not needed to run the day-to-day -day business. And it's dividend money, it's, it's cash flow that was generated in prior periods that could have been dividend, could have been used to buy back shares, but was not. So I want you to dividend that out and then sell the business. That's what excess cash is. It's truly not needed for the business and it's subjective. There is no hard and fast rule. I generally use the short-term investment line on the balance sheet because if I, I figure that if a company is calling it out as its own separate line, it's not in the cash bucket on the balance sheet, I deem that to be excess cash. Market cap, average share price, uh, I use the fiscal month end, so this is December fiscal year. I use December's fiscal average times the shares outstanding. There's a couple places you can find shares outstanding by use. You can use on the income statement, if you scroll all the way down to the income statement, it'll say weighted average shares outstanding. That is the weighted average shares over the entire year. Also, if you pick up the 10K, you look at the very first page all the way down, it'll say, it'll say shares outstanding. That's av as of the issue date or as of the fiscal year end of that document you're looking at, 10K, 10Q. So there's always a little bit of difference depending upon how you want to look at it. I use weighted average shares. You can use year end shares. Depends on what's going on. Point here is long-winded, but it's good background. Point here, one point, excuse me, $138 billion of market cap to $234 billion of market cap. Uh, not quite doubling. I add this debt, less this cash, plus the market cap, and I get enterprise value. Enterprise value is the magic number. Enterprise value is the entire business. Do not, do not simply look at the stock price in the market. I don't care about that number, neither should you. A, you can manipulate that number simply by reverse splitting or splitting the shares, just like Tesla has done countless, countless times and people are elated that they got more shares. It doesn't matter. It does not change the value of the company. Think of a pie and if I slice that pie into more, more slices, it does not change the size of the pie. The size of the pie is enterprise value. That's what it is. You peel off the debt, whatever's borrowed, and you get market cap. You split the market cap and you get shares. That's how it works. And you always, always want to look at enterprise value because the stock price only looks at market cap. It misses, in this case, $100 billion of owed money. So always want to look at that. Now, enterprise value, we're going to do a relative measure here. I'm going to take we're gonna cover debt first. I'm gonna take debt, the total debt that I had, the 100 billion, and I'm gonna divide it by the EBITDA, my adjusted earnings, earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. It tells me how much roughly cash they make by running the business um, on an annual basis, aside from taxes, aside from uh, CapEx reinvestment. And what that tells me is it says I have $107 billion of debt outstanding here. I make $34 billion a year, actually pretty consistently, right? It's not all over the place. It's steady, steady, steady growth. That means a little under three years, I could pay all this off if I truly had to. And this is what a bank looks at. And that's why they put it on their Q2 report, their coverage ratio, because banks don't want to lend money to highly leveraged institutions. In this world of rising interest rates, that interest expense gets very heavy and it gets very burdensome for companies to continue to pay. They're called zombie companies. They were out in the market a long time ago because they could not generate enough cash flow to pay down the debt. They could only make the interest payment. They could never pay it back. So a bank does not own the equity. They, do, they, have, they have zero upside at all in this business. They're only lending the money. They want the principal back. They wanna make sure they get it back. That's why they stake to three times. That's why you need to make sure you're less than three times. Okay. So I divide the two and I get a payback period. What I like to see here is it's two, 2.1, 2.3. It's growing a little bit because they made some acquisitions. It's three at the end of the fiscal year. Their most recent quarter, 2.6, it's coming down. They're paying it, they're keeping it below three. It got a little above, now it's coming down, I like that. That's financial discipline right there. 
The next one is a relative value, enterprise value divided by EBITDA. Why do we use this? EBITDA is not free cash flow. Totally get it. We're going to get to free cash flow in a second. We use it because when M&A transactions happen in investment banking, in um, uh, private equity world, even when public companies buy other public companies, they express that purchase price as a multiple of enterprise value to EBITDA. So what I can do and you can do, you can say, oh, uh, Johnson & Johnson just bought this toothpaste company for 10 times EBITDA. Oh, let me see what Johnson & Johnson's trading at in the public market. Oh, they're trading at 20 times EBITDA? That means they bought a company for $10 billion, 10 times EBITDA, and instantly, instantly, they double its value by consolidating the EBITDA into their earnings, and their earnings on the street get 20 times. That is a market multiple expansion, it's one of the trifectas. It's right, it's right there, what we look for. That is why we use it, because it's a quick gauge to figure out are acquisitions truly accretive to a business or not. And what we're going to look here is we're going to see 8.568. 8, so it's in this 8 range, high of 11. Uh, it's currently, at, well, it was last fiscal year, 9.8 uh, times EBITDA. So that's a number of, time, number of years that they need to make EBITDA to equal the enterprise value. Another relative value measure. All right, let's look at hard free cash flow to see what really matters in this business. Okay, let's take a look at free cash flow where the rubber meets the road. So uh, CFO cash flow from operations adjusted. All I do is subtract uh, share-based compensation. It's not cash, but I treat it as though it were cash because I want to know what their kind of adjusted cash flow would look like. If they had to pay this company's in cash, what they gave them in stock, I want to make sure they still have cash to cover all the other things they have to do. Cash flow from operations on the cash flow statement is the first third of the cash flow statement. It's the cash money, hard currency that they make from running their business, selling internet services, uh, the fees that they get from Peacock that people are, are paying for the um, uh, NBC Universal, the Sky Network, after they pay employees, after they pay rent, after they pay utilities, um, after they pay their legal and advertising and corporate, all that stuff. How much actual cash is left after doing that? That is this number. And that number is $13.7 billion and it has grown to 27, call it $28 billion of jack that they made last year simply providing people their, with their internet. And that's pretty cool. Internet is a life, it's, it absolutely has to happen these days. You're watching it right now on the internet. So I think this is incredibly sticky and I love the fact that it's growing slightly higher, but, but in the same line as earnings. So good job, kudos to the accounting team. That means that they're expensing things properly. If you ever see a company, which over a long period of time, You've got enterprise, you've got earnings growing, but, uh, but cash flow is shrinking. That means something funny is going on and the business is trying to show you profit that isn't turning into cash. And that's a big problem. Here, I like it. We've got long-term averages of cash flows growing in line with operating income. Beautiful. Thank you. Good job, accounting team. CapEx. What is CapEx? CapEx. Capital. Capital right there. Expense. It just means the money they invest back in their network. If they have to go um, lay fiber optic cable across New England or Florida, wherever they're going to go, that's here. It is the repainting of buildings. It's the infrastructure they need to keep the ball moving. It is not, it is not acquisitions. Uh, it, is, it is the um, investment that's going to yield cash in the future for them. And what I like to see, what we always want to see, is we want to see this spread right here. The cash flow from operations minus the capex, this number should be positive. Some companies is negative, and that means they have to finance the difference. And right here, every single year, they can pay for it. So last year, $27, $28 billion of jack landed in the bank account after running the business. They said, what do we do with this? They had a board meeting. They said, let's reinvest some in our business. So they peel off $10 billion and put it back in the business. That means they have 17 or 18 billion dollars on the uh, on the balance sheet left over from running the business after having reinvested in the business. So what do they do with that? They buy back stock, they pay dividends, they build excess free cash on the balance sheet. That's where this number here, that's why there's excess cash. If you see businesses that don't have excess cash, that means they're 
dividending out, they're buying back shares or they're making acquisitions. They're consuming it in some other way. These guys uh, are storing some of it on the balance sheet. So what does that mean? This means also that they paid down debt. Eight point, almost $9 billion they bought down last year. The cool thing is now they're under the three times. I don't expect that to be the same thing every single year. I think that's gonna go much more to zero. And this cash is gonna pass through to us. You and I, the equity owners, if you buy the stock, if I own it, I don't own it right now, but I'm just saying that if you own it, that's your free cash flow. And that cash flow is what the business is valued on regardless of the stock price. That's the true value of the business. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zero this out just for funsies right now, just to see how much actual jack they make next year if, if, if 20, 2021 were to repeat itself, they didn't buy down the debt. This is $17 billion. The number of shares outstanding, 4.6 billion shares. And that share count is shrinking. They are taking the free cash flow. They're going into the stock market. They're buying shares and they're tearing them up and throwing them away. And that means that your ownership of this cash flowing business is slowly growing without you paying taxes and without you having to put another dime into the business. That's a great thing. That really is. It really is a great thing. So they've, they've trimmed almost 800 million shares outstanding in the last decade. Wonderful. So now I got $17.6 billion of free cash flow. Divide by the shares, that means I have 3.8, sorry, $3.80 of free cash flow per share. The business is trading for $50 per share, and the free cash flow yield is 7.5%. That's what it was trading at historically. Let's go check it, let's make a forecast. Let's figure out what we think this business is truly worth. And then let's look in the public market and see what we can buy it for. You ready? Let's keep going. All right, let's forecast this business. So what do we want to do? We know that this business grows at 6 7% a year on average, roughly. So we're going to pick a number out there. And believe me, we're going to be wrong. Uh, the idea is not to get the number right per se. The idea is to build a forecast that you believe you're willing to put your money in. Then look at the stock price to see if it works out economically. But don't just follow a forecast because that's what the street says it should do. You want to put a forecast together that you're willing to put your money against. Then if the number works, then it's something interesting to buy. Don't just follow what the street says. So what we're doing is I'm going to bring down their growth rate slightly. And I'm going to say, hey, look, they're going to grow at 5% annually over time to see what that looks like. So I'm going to start with $36 billion. I'm going to grow that at 5%. That 5% could be a, a combination of a lot of things. It could be uh, customer growth. So as their fiber optic network expands or as their coaxial network expands, they get uh, more customers as NBC Universal grows, as the Peacock subscription grows, they get more customers. Or, and or, the price per customer goes up. If you get an increase in your uh, utility bill, you pay it. Why? Because you need the lights to come on. If you get an increase in your internet bill, you pay it. Why? Because you want to get on the internet. So I think there's tremendous pricing power here, and I think that this is doable. What I would do if I were you and I was buying the stock, I would break out the three business units. I would build a forecast for each of those three business units, combine them, and see what you get. But here, for simplicity, I'm doing 5% <clears throat> out long-term. That gets me $56 billion of long-term EBITDA. I'm going to play in 9.2% market multiple to that. That's a strong recurring business. It's a decent multiple. That gives me half a billion dollars, excuse me, half a trillion dollars of enterprise value, $516 billion. I less the debt that I kept on the books. I didn't pay it down. I didn't grow it. I just kept it the same. You get $408 billion of uh, market cap. Divide by the same shares outstanding. I didn't shrink the share count. We'll get into that in a second. And I get $87.87 for a for cash, uh, excuse me, a, a price forecast for Comcast out 10 years from now as a, you know, estimate of what it could be worth. All right, let's take a look at free cash flow. Okay, free cash flow is going to follow the same methodology. I'm growing EBITDA at 5%. I'm going to grow free cash flow at 5% because A, they're not going to reinvest more heavily than they have been historically in CapEx. They'll keep the same ratio. B, they're not going to buy down debt or borrow more debt. So what our growth and earnings they have is going to pass through the equity holders. So these growth rates are the same. I'm going to pick up 
that uh, last year's free cash flow without the debt, I think it was $3.80. I'm gonna grow it at 5%, I get just shy of four bucks. I grow that in a, out in the future, I'm thinking around $6 per share out a decade from now. I'm gonna apply a 6.4 yield to that. Remember we saw a yield that was 7.5% earlier when I took out the debt. 6.4 is the average, I think I did the math over here, just excluding the debt so I can figure out whether nine year average yield for this stock should be outside the debt. And I divide these two and I get a $96.39 and $96.39 price target for Comcast out 10 years. All right, now we've got two price estimates under two different methodologies. Let's figure out what the stock price is trading at today. Okay, here we go. Um, we have two different price targets, free cash flow method and enterprise value method. A free cash flow method, I get $96 and change. The enterprise value method, I get $87 and change. Which one's right? Who knows? The stock price on self itself moves, uh, you know, could move 25, 40% in a year. So you're just trying to get a band, a range out there as a guide. So call it 90 bucks uh, out a decade from now. Well, now, now that we have an opinion on the company, now we look in the stock price, stock market for the price. Don't look at the stock price before you make the forecast. It'll, it'll, it'll taint what you think about the business. It, it just will. 30 bucks, I can buy as much share, uh, as many shares as I want right now for $30 a share. I think in, in a decade, it could be worth three times that, that's $92 a share. Uh, if I do a little quick math off the side, current enterprise value, a quarter of a billion dollars. Next year's enterprise value is, 30, is excuse me, next year's EBITDA, $36 billion. <clears throat> that means it's trading right now at a, a 6.7 times multiple. What do we say it's gonna trade at in the future? My exit multiple is 9.2. That is a market multiple expansion. Just my, like I said, my earlier example of when um, uh, Johnson Johnson buys a toothpaste company for five, it was 10, they roll it, they're 20. That market multiple expansion is a huge source of gain for investors over the long run. And that's why you buy stocks that are low in price. That's why price matters. Um, Check out my Domino's versus Google's IPO video. I've done two different videos and then updating that. It's why Domino's stock has outperformed Google over the last 15 years because you could have bought it dirt cheap. Here we go. 6.7, it's yield. If I take the forward almost $4 of free cash flow, divide by the 30 bucks, that's a 13% free cash flow yield. Do you get that all? No. Dividend yield is only 3%. But what do they do with the other 10% of cash flow? A, buy back shares. B, they can go acquire other assets. They can grow. They can do whatever they want because cash money is what drives the business. So highly, highly recommend buying stocks in this market that are out there that are yielding high results. All right, let's drop this into our IRR and figure out how much return we think we can make if we bought the stock and held for a decade. Okay, here we go. We've got three our free cash flow per share that we think we're gonna earn our pro rata ownership, not dividend. I buy the stock for 30 bucks, I'm out at 92. This is my free stream of cash flow. And when I put that into an IRR calculation, I get 27% annualized growth rate. That means, um, or an an annualized investment return. That 27% IRR means that on average, over the decade, if the assumptions behind me pan out, your initial investment would have earned 27% interest every year for a decade. That means you'll make roughly five times your money over that period of time. A very interesting return stock profile, especially if you consider the stock market itself, the S&P 500, will return roughly 10% on any 10 year period of time that you look into. Having a stock with a potential three times that, that return uh, is very attractive. And so I think it meets meets the criteria for us. Let's let's recap our five key attributes. Number one, top line revenue growth. Yes, it's growing. Number two, EBITDA. Yes, it's growing. It's single digit grower. Number three, strong free cash flow. Yeah, they can afford their CapEx. They're yielding 13%. Number four, low debt. Absolutely. It's less than three times debt and management seems to know that and then report it. Number five, well priced. Yes, I think it's well priced because we've assumed a 5% annual earnings growth and we get a monster return projected above the stock market. This 
ladies and gentlemen, is what I like to call on this channel a trifecta. It's why I'm wearing the trifecta t-shirt. What does that mean? It means I get simply earnings growth. That's the 5% earnings growth that we need annually. I get a market multiple expansion. That is us buying it at six and a half, six point seven times and exiting at nine. And I get a share buyback. It's what they've been doing before. They bought back 800 million shares over time. That means you have a growing business that is expanding in its purchase multiple and your ownership in that business is growing. That is a trifecta and that's how hockey stick returns are, are, are generated. Is it a guarantee? Absolutely not. I have no idea what the future is going to look like. This is purely math behind me. But if I'm going to have draw, but if you're going to invest money, you are making bets on the future and you want to try to find a company that's got um, the, 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 the greatest probability of achieving its result. And I think if you bring down your assumptions, if you make growth estimates 5%, 2%, really low growth estimates. And you make your market multiples really low, single digits. This is nine times exit. I'm not exiting at 20 times earnings. I'm not at 50 or 60 times like Salesforce is still up there. If you bring down your assumptions, I think, in my opinion, the risk comes down. And if you can do all of that and still have a stock price, with stock with a potential return that's three times the S&P 500, I think it's very attractive. And I think that's why I'm calling this a trifecta. I'm going to give it a good as far as long-term investment, I will caution you, behind me is simply math. You need to read the 10Ks, you need to take my financial course, and you need to get this model and do your own assumptions. And then after you've done all your homework and research, if you still think it, consult the financial advisor and then figure out what you want to do. Let's take a look at a distribution. So here's the 30, let's take a distribution. Here's the $30 per share 27 um, IRR. If the stock price goes up, I'm still very interesting, still very attractive. If for some reason it should fall, uh, and, this, and, the, and the underlying assumptions about the long-term value haven't changed, I think it gets even better. It's a very, very interesting stock for me. Um, I, I don't own it, but I would consider it. Uh, what I want to do is I want to now remind you and put up the website here, cashflowinvestingpro.com. In the link below, you can get a link to my website. Check out my financial investment course. If you take it, it'll teach you the fundamentals you need. It'll give you this modeling. It'll teach you for a deck for your life. You'll be able to use this information for the rest of your life on all kinds of deals. It's very, very useful information. It's information I wish I got 20 years ago, but I had to work as a CFO go through investment banking to distill down the basics of what truly is investing, which I think I've kind of distilled down for you. And it's what this channel is all about. Also, in the cash flow club, I just post on LinkedIn, if you saw it, and on Twitter that I'm looking for analysts and they are joining the club and we're going to expand the reach and the, the breadth of coverage of stocks and truly build a very unique um, club of cash flow conservative forecasting uh, conservative forecasts and try to find businesses that yield double digit cash flows like this publish them in the group and let people go get them so every every week we are publishing one pages this has 10 years of financial information in it. it summarizes the five key attributes it gives you the cash flow forecast it gives you the EBITDA forecast it summarizes the IRR and there's a write-up to give you some of the highlights of the stock and we kick these out in the cash flow club in the description below, you can download a free copy. Take a look. Go to my website. You can jump in. I've got several of the Cashflow Club, uh, Cashflow One Pagers available for you to review. If you like it, join the club. Uh, I highly recommend that you do so and you stick in there for a year. It will provide you with a spectrum of what the market can do. I one thing that I have learned, in, in if, if I've learned anything, is that in investing, it's all about perspective. I used to work for private, I still work for private equity companies. When I was uh, when I was doing that work, you would look for deal flow. It's what everyone looks for. You want to see as many deals, this is the private biz, private equity, private deal world. You want to see as many deals as possible because it gives you a gauge on what is possible out there. If you see one deal, you can't gauge it against anything. But if you see 100 deals in a year, you know the good ones from the bad ones. And that's the idea with the cash flow club. You want to see those monthly, excuse me, the weekly publications so you can understand what is a relatively good deal, such as Comcast, in my opinion, versus a bad deal, which might be like a Tesla or something like that, that is, or a, a Salesforce. Even though I love the company, it's still at a very, very high price. It's hard to get 
your arms around it. So, uh, so I would definitely check it out. Stick around, learn a lot, become a better investor. Um, and I'm also going to be doing um, uh, webinars in there for the Cash Flow Club members where we can talk one-on-one -on -one and talk shop. So I highly recommend it. Take a look. Thank you very much for watching this video and the rambling about the club. I'm sorry, but I appreciate it. I really do. This is Comcast. Ta uh, let me know what you think. Throw a comment down below. It helps the algorithm. Always does. I'm trying to get a new benchmark. I'd love to get to 100,000 subscribers on the channel and actually certify the channel with YouTube. I got a bunch of people who are trolling uh, for fake comments. They they take my uh, my image and they per impersonate me and try to get viewers like yourself to sign up on WhatsApp accounts. It's garbage. I'm never ever going to ask you to put any money into WhatsApp or do any of that stuff. It's It was not, not my style. So if you want to contact me, my email is down below. Hit me up. I'm happy to address questions, uh, take stock tips, throw a comment down in the channel. Don't forget to hit the like button or the subscribe button. It really does help me out and share it on social media. I appreciate every every viewer. I really do. Uh, I hope everyone's safe and happy. This market is absolutely insane. Uh, the, the interest rates are going even higher. I think we're going to, in theory, so the, this the economic theory <clears throat> is that in order to stop inflation, you have to raise the Fed funds rate above inflation. Uh, that means that the Fed funds rate has to go to 8% in the United States which would be absolutely devastating for a whole host of asset uh, bubbles that are still out there. So uh, hang on your hats. It might get a little more rocky. But the good news is if you're a cash flow buyer and you have cash sitting in your balance sheet, there are going to be a lot of deals out there. So uh, just like Comcast getting cheap, lots of other stuff is getting cheap. I wish you the best. Uh, thank you very much. This is Comcast. This is Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.